Hi, I'm Tom Burgess and welcome to The Real Agenda and the second episode in our new series, The State We Are In, with Gavin Esler. Now today, we're going to look at the United States elections and more specifically the presidential election and why it is so important, not just to the USA, not just to the UK, but to the world. Now the United States is a nation of 328 million people where 46 million live in poverty, and yet 14 billion was spent to persuade 160 million people who voted. That's nearly $90 for each voter. And I've got a special interest here as I worked on the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016 while living in California and met him and his family on a couple of occasions. Now, how will the outcome of the US elections address the real agenda? That's the toxic inequality and the unnecessary financial hardship suffered by millions every day. Let's find out. Gavin Esler has an unrivaled objective experience of the United States as a BBC North America correspondent before becoming presenter of BBC Newsnight in 2003. And during the Clinton years, he visited 48 of the 50 states and wrote a book, called The United States of Anger, published in 1998. Today, Gavin talks exclusively to the real agenda. I started by asking Gavin why the USA elections are so important. One of the things that's really interesting is that uh, over the past 20 or 30 years, American decline has been one of its oldest traditions. You know, I have, the number of books I've read about the, the end of the American empire or the, 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 the America's finished, it's going to be overtaken by China and so on. And yet when you see the killing of an African-American man in Minnesota led to demonstrations around the world, uh, we listen to American music, watch American movies. America remains still the world's greatest cultural superpower. Whether we resent it, whether we dislike it, whatever we think of Trump, that is still true. So America remains important in so many ways. And the fact that Black Lives Matter sparked things around the world just shows how important it is in terms of cultural leadership or otherwise. And and therefore, what happens in the United States in the most obvious sense does affect us because we think we understand particularly British people, but also people right around the world, think they understand America because we see so much of it, from going back to cowboy movies and the the heyday of Hollywood. And so therefore the person who leads America has got a choice. They can either be, and just to take two Republicans, they can either be like Ronald Reagan and see America as a shining city on a hill. Now again, whether you like Reagan or not, he did see it as a beacon for the world. Um... Or you can see it like Donald Trump and some within the modern Republican Party see see it as a kind of bastion, the fortress America, make America great again, build the wall, America first. Those are effectively the two visions of America. And I think what we've seen is those two visions have been in conflict. And the vision uh, that Biden has, although he's, he's not as, uh, what would one say, he doesn't... Uh, uh, orate in the way that Ronald Reagan did, but he certainly sees America as being a, 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 a shining city on a hill, a kind of example to other people. And I think many, many people around the world like that bit of America. Uh, we don't perhaps like what's sometimes called American imperialism, but that is the vision which just seems to have triumphed over the fortress America, America first vision of Donald Trump. But it was close, wasn't it, with the presidential elections in terms of the uh, popular vote? Yes. I mean, I think, I think what is interesting uh, is that after four years of scrutiny and relentless scrutiny, 71 million Americans still preferred Donald Trump. So they still preferred that vision of America. And you may care to ask why, what's going on there, because it, it can't be. It simply cannot be that 71 million Americans are blind to what Mr. Trump has done. And many of them, certainly 60 million Americans, knew what he was like four years ago and still voted for him. So uh, Trump is finished, I think. Um, uh, Whether he continues to grumble and make trouble and 
even when he is out of office, think about running again, which he can do, is, I suppose, possible. But it does seem that he may be finished, but Trumpism certainly isn't finished. And the Republican Party has got to deal with that. The Republican Party has got to decide whether this uh, figure that they have fallen in behind so overwhelmingly, actually, in terms of Republican leadership until recently, um, is somebody that they think defines their future. And therefore, that's going to be one of the big stories, I think, of the next four years. What do the Republicans do in the post-Trump era? Do they continue to embrace some of his policies, some of his wilder rhetoric or not? And just one, one, one other caveat, um, one other point. Donald Trump, we often think that he is completely outside uh, completely uh, unique, you know, just such an odd, oddball figure with his uh, horrible attitudes to women and, and so on. But actually, he is in a very simple tradition of, uh, of American presidents, of some American presidents, you know, cut taxes, go play golf and don't do much else. And so that is clearly appealing to some people in the United States, and forgetting the rhetoric, of, of course, the really offensive rhetoric, the tweets and so on. But in a way, that's where he's been groundbreaking because that's been his genius. He figured out more than anyone else in the entire world how to communicate when we're all attention poor and how to break through that to get your message across in 200 or so characters in twi Twitter, mostly. With this election, there was two choices. Was it just one, tr one for Trump and one for not Trump? I, I think... I think I think it was. I think it was a referendum on Trump, one for Trump and one for not Trump. Uh, I'm not saying that anybody would have beaten Trump. Uh, Biden has got some quite remarkable qualities. He comes across as decent and calm. And those two things are not the adjectives you would immediately use about Donald Trump, whatever else you think, think of him. So he, he did have some qualities. But I mean, just the, the idea that Donald Trump tried to persuade him, to persuade the American people that Joe Biden is a socialist. I can't think of any definition of socialism that Joe Biden would fit into. Um, so it was it was quite a obviously quite a nasty election, unique in the sense that it was conducted during the pandemic. Um, and but I'm not sure that Biden was elected because of his own qualities, which I personally believe are considerable. I think he was, as you imply, he was elected because he wasn't Donald Trump, and it was a referendum on Trump. But he, but he certainly wasn't a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, uh, no, I, d I just don't. But I mean, look, uh, in Republican rhetoric over the past uh, 15 years, uh, I have heard so often that uh, the British health system is socialised medicine. Um, in other words, the government plays a role. So uh, if, if, that, if, if the NHS is your definition of socialism, well, then perhaps, you know, Biden and... and Barack, Ob Barack Obama were. I should also say that I've also heard from the Republican right in the past 20 years that, that the British health system consists of death panels that decide whether you can live or die. Um, I've heard that from quite quite otherwise intelligent Republicans. What they mean is the, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence decides whether the NHS can afford certain drugs, whether they're worth the money. So because we think we understand America, there is a whole kind of debate and language and uh, that's used in the English language in America which sounds to most British ears is nonsensical. The thing is really Biden has, doesn't seem to have a, a strong agenda he's certainly not Trump and he seems like a decent guy and obviously we've been exposed to him before when he was vice president but you know he, he doesn't come over as being in favour of we just talked about healthcare you know Medicare for all or put it up and increase in the um the minimum wage and so on, although he has made some sort of statements on that. And a few other things. It's really, well, it's back to business as usual. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I think Biden uh, represents uh, a couple of things. One, one is he represents the international leadership of America, at least that, as they would like to see it. So therefore, he will be back in the World Health Organization. Uh, he will be playing an active role in the World Health Organization. They will be playing an active role at the UN. They will be trying to work multilaterally around the world. They will be involved with climate change and take a positive attitude to COP26 in Glasgow next year. Um, so so he, he does have a very, very different agenda. And, uh, you know, the difficulties of healthcare in America are, as we know, 
incredible. Hillary Clinton tried to introduce a health care bill in 1993. And I know the Republican leader in the Senate, Bob Dole, told me he'd never read it. In fact, he said, I couldn't even pick it up. It was, I think it was something like uh, 1300 pages. So he didn't even look at it. So that is one of the many battles and one of the battles that depend upon having the Senate behind him. And I, uh, you know, I can't think of a president who comes in 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 recent terms without uh, without at least the chance of the senate being behind him now that depends on the two seats in georgia the democrats would have to win both in the runoff elections and i suppose it's possible and if it does happen kamala harris would then as vice president would have the casting vote in the senate and then biden would be able to get things done but it's that it was sort of pointless for Biden to set up a huge agenda, which he knows can't get through Congress. So it's going to be very difficult. Um, On the other hand, the advantage for Biden, and I've seen this many, many times before in American politics, is if he can't get things done, he can blame the Senate and he can blame the Republicans in the Senate. And there will be further senator, uh, you know, a third of the Senate's up every two years. So uh, it's going to be very difficult. He does represent, in a sense, return to that American word normalcy, the kind of normal leaders, normal Democrat leaders that we've come to expect, very different from this not really mainstream Republican Donald Trump, although he's changed the mainstream. And it's going to be very difficult for him. But he does definitely have an agenda, and it is certainly a multilateral one. Well, that's good to know. The But um, what about the American electoral system, which, you know, was clearly laid out many years ago and uh, seemed very good? But is it fit for purpose, you know, currently, now that the fact that, you know, it goes on for so long? I mean, which country has elections that last for three years? <laughs> Well, the British uh, have to be very careful about criticising anybody else's method of electing uh, people to Parliament or government or Congress or anywhere else. I mean, we have a government that's got just uh, just over 43% of the vote and it's got a massive majority of 80 seats. We've got a non-elected upper chamber and we have got a non-elected head of state. So it seems to me that the one country in the entire world which has to be very careful about criticising how anybody else uh, runs elections is this one because ours are pretty... Um, shambolic it seems to me we really do have an electoral system from the time of the horse and cart and in fact that's one of the things I'm writing about in my my new book how Britain ends but in terms of in terms of the American system the good news is they do have a written constitution so they do have documents that they can argue about uh, which separates powers when they can argue about that as well but it gives them a kind of roadmap that's the good thing the bad thing is it floats on a sea of money, um, and that is, you know, eye-watering amounts of, of money. Um, and secondly, as you say, it takes so long to come to any conclusion. But the thing is, the advantage of having a written constitution is so much is devolved to the states, and one of the things that's devolved to the states is deciding, in effect, how they are going to figure out whether they vote for a particular person or not, how they run those elections and and how that works on a federal system. So when you've got that broadly devolved system, and I'm I'm broadly in favour of devolution, I'd like to see a lot more of it in in the United Kingdom, you are going to run into the fact that Florida has its own rules and Michigan has its own rules and Pennsylvania has its own rules and, and it can be quite difficult and it can end up in, in court. So I, I agree with your basic principle that that Americans need to rethink how they uh, conduct elections but I'm I'm tempted to say there ain't no votes in it you know and the same is true in Britain we have spent so many times that people say this the House of Lords reforms of Labour just really didn't go anywhere it's a bit ridiculous this is not something that gets people really really excited except once every few years so I think while I think the American system or systems uh, could do with a quite a bit of reform in many many different ways as do many Americans I don't think it's going to happen I wouldn't hold your breath okay we won't hold our breath there exactly I know it's gonna it would take a while to do but you wrote a book back in 1998 the United States of anger so Americans are angry then are they still angry well, I, th- I think so. I mean, the, the, what happened 
in the 1990s was I lived in the United States for more than eight years and I spent probably another six or seven years uh, where I spent at least three months a year in the United States. So I travelled to 48 of the 50 states and this was the good times. This was the 1990s. The uh, Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union collapsed, communism uh, appeared dead as a, a, as a threat to Western democracy. And yet so many Americans in this unipolar world that I met, ordinary Americans everywhere, everywhere, um, said that in one way or another they were unhappy with their lives. And what they were unhappy about, many of them, well, it was summed up, it was summed up by a police officer in Annapolis, Maryland, who said to me, Bill Clinton claims he's created 11 million new jobs. He probably has, but me and my wife have got five of them. His wife worked, he worked as a cop uh, for, I think it was uh, five days in a row, and then he got three days off. And on those three days off, he worked as a security guard in various places, including a yacht harbour and a nightclub. And he said, my dad was a cop here in Annapolis, and he got by, and my mum didn't have to work, and we, were, we had a better standard of living than we have now. Now, he may have been wrong about that, in, if you if you add up the figures, I'm not sure life in the 1950s was better than it was in the 1990s for most Americans. But that's the way he felt. And that kind of irritation, anger, and actually fear about not being able to make ends meet, part of which was connected to healthcare, biggest cause of personal bankruptcy in the United States. I didn't mention Donald Trump, but I did say in the book that given the inadequacies, in my view, of the American electoral system and the anger of so many people, decent people I've met across America. If ever there is some kind of um, orator who stirs up passions, particularly after a recession, because remember the Clinton years were the good years, it, particularly after a recession, America could find itself in great trouble. Now, I didn't, I didn't predict Trump, but I did predict, I think, uh, in the book, that this anger had to somehow be addressed. And Trump, in a way, although he didn't address it and in a way fomented it, um, he at least understood it. And he seemed to, the, this to me at least, is one of the reasons why he got 71 million votes. Enough Americans thought that this supposed billionaire, New Yorker, who's a very oddball figure, understood them and understood their plight in a way that the political system, the Bidens and the Hillary Clintons didn't. And that phenomenon continues. And it will continue for many years to come i think what about populism i mean is it would you describe um donald trump as a populist i would one big question i don't have an answer to it is have we have we hit peak populism has does this mark a turning point uh people like orban and uh some of the leaders in poland who and boris johnson who in a sense tied their their colours to the trump mast and seem very you know boris johnson seemed to be quite pleased to be called Britain Trump by Donald Trump. Is the writing on the wall for them? In a, it may take some time, certainly in Britain. But one of the things about populism, it seems to me, is that populism is about salesmanship. It's not about achievement. So Trump was a brilliant salesman, absolutely brilliant. I mean, he, he had a life for you. He used to sell steaks on television. Please buy my meat. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And, and other things which are, you know, just now look rather embarrassing. Uh, he's a very, very good salesman. Boris Johnson is a very, very good salesman. But when you ask yourself, what did they actually achieve? Well, you know, come walk with me over the garden bridge with Boris Johnson, and I'll tell you, it, not very much. So he's very, very good at promising world beating this and world beating that and then taking um, credit for it. And Donald Trump was the same. Did he build a wall and make Mexico pay for it? No, he didn't. Did he make America great again? Well, actually, uh, I, don't, I don't think American leadership in... 2020 is really a leadership that many other countries, particularly Western European countries, are interested in the following. If populism means that you are popular uh, because you sell something, I think that's part of it. But I think very often it means you just don't achieve because in the end you can lie, as, as Trump has done repeatedly for four years, but the facts will tell against you. And I think we're seeing something similar in our country, we were told, for example, by Boris Johnson that, um, you know, Britain would still have access to the single market. He said it in 2016. Um, it was quite, quite clear about it. And no deal was not even mentioned or being contemplated. And there was, Northern Ireland was not a problem. It, the border in Ireland is no more significant than the border between what was it, Camden and Westminster, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
in the end, facts matter. And they matter in the United States. And we may be seeing peak populism. I don't know, but I think it's possible. Well, one of the things is that, you know, we get told that these things are going to happen or I'm going to do this and that, as you've just described. They don't happen, but no one see, you know, feels that it then gets forgotten. And they get away well, with saying these things. Donald Trump gets away with it, Boris Johnson and various others. You can say what you like and people forget about it. And also, particularly with Donald Trump, he, you know, he sort of pushed the button, like having political meetings at, at the White House and these other sort of things where he broke the protocol. They get away with it. You're right. Uh, you're absolutely right. So that's why I was uh, trying to be a bit cautious about whether we are uh, peak populism or not. To go back to an earlier point in our conversation, Donald Trump's genius, and I don't use this word lightly, Donald Trump's genius is to cut through the babble of stuff that we're surrounded by. And I'm, I don't just mean, you know, there's, there's a few people in America who, who go on completely lunatic websites like QAnon and so on and, and, and believe complete nonsense. But what happens is, and it happens in Britain too, there may be something that should be deeply concerning. And then suddenly something pops up that uh, whether you like it or it enrages you, pops up on a tweet or some something that the Boris Johnson has said or... Uh, which is a complete distraction. And the politics of distraction, this, you know, famously throwing a dead cat on the table, works because most of us have jobs and uh, uh, livelihoods and kids and, you know, family commitments, and we don't have that much time to spend listening to all this stuff. And those of us who are journalists and do spend a lot of time uh, keep going back and saying, but remember, remember, they, they said this was going to be different, Brexit being a classic example. And yet they do get away with it. Now, we have not yet coped with it. And I think what populist leaders have done brilliantly, Trump being the best example, is use the new technology and the new media to cut through this blizzard of information and make it very simple. And what other leaders, Hillary Clinton being a good example, have have done is produce policy papers, which nobody ever reads and uh, possibly very erudite, possibly very good but nobody ever reads them, instead of which we just see a hat that says make America great again, and that sounds good, so we vote for that. And that may still be true. It may still be true. But uh, having had Pete Trump, perhaps things will change. So it's not about the policies, it's about the emotional about yeah. emotions behind it. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, most of us, taking coronavirus as, as, as an interest, uh, a good example, we're not experts. We listen to the experts. They have some divisions, but it's kind of clear they've, they've got basic information which says we need to do certain things. And so most of us, most of us try to do it. But what cuts through is to be told we've got a world beating test and trace system. We've got we're going to have a world beating vaccine. We're going to have a vaccine by next week or next month or next, by, by Christmas. And everybody's whether it happens or not, we tend to forget we follow the distraction, and let's hope it's all. Tr- let's hope it's all true. I mean, this doesn't minimise the difficulties of dealing with coronavirus, but uh, it does show how easy it is to distract us with other things. And in fact, Brexit being the, being a great example. No matter how many times you tell people that you couldn't possibly have voted for a new no deal Brexit in 2016 in that advisory referendum. I have met people at book festivals and elsewhere who said that's exactly what I voted for. I have met people at book festivals who tell me they voted to get out without a deal on October the 31st, 2019, which was a date only set in the spring of 2019. It was not set in 2016. So some of this nonsense cuts through. And no matter how many times you say that can't possibly have been true, um, some people continue to believe it, not because they're not because they're evil or stupid or anything, but because those kind of things play to their emotions and they remember them. Oh, so that's what we have to do then. We just have to, or do hopefully not, but, you know, just lie about something or just talk about world beating and uh, and everyone's going to say, oh, good, OK, I'll go with that. It seems to have worked for some people. Uh, I'm not recommending that, obviously. Uh, what what I'm recommending is is enlightenment values truths facts and so on and the facts are sometimes difficult and sometimes actually they're quite boring they really can be quite quite tedious the facts about how you uh, trade with foreign countries 
uh, particularly European countries, if you're not in the European Union, those facts are really quite boring until you find that your insulin is stuck at the docks or there's 7,000 lorries in Kent uh, with a tail back beyond Ashford from, from Dover, then it, ce- it ceases to be boring. Um, so that's why it may be that we need to see some more facts on the ground rather than informed views as to what those facts will be. And there's plenty of informed views about about those. I mean, just the number of... I was looking at something um, recently. How many forms would you have to fill in to take a ham sandwich from Northern Ireland to the Irish Republic or from Britain to Northern Ireland? <laughs> to be honest, I did read the article and at the end of it, I was more confused than when I, when I started because it is boring. But somebody has to know that stuff. How many uh, forms in? I can't remember. I I read it. I thought this is very amusing. Um, I I think the answer is I'm going to eat the ham sandwich, <laughs> so I don't have to declare it at customs. On your, if you were to make some, make some recommendations to Uncle Joe in his new role. By the way, have you met have you met Joe in your travels? No, I didn't. I never I never met Biden actually. I, I tell you, the closest I come to to Joe Biden is I was a neighbour of Neil Kinnock's for many well twice actually in two different places for some reason and Neil Kinnock as you may remember played a part in the Joe Biden story because he said Neil Kinnock at a great speech said I'm the first uh, Kinnock in a thousand generations to go to university Biden liked it so much he just copied it and he got into t- I remember when Rouse used to be about things like that and he said I'm the first Biden in a thousand generations to go to university and it was a mini 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 scandal about plagiarism and as a result Kinnock and Biden became quite close. And Neil Kinnock told me he's a really, really decent guy, really grounded. He's had some terrible life experiences. You know, some bad things have happened in his personal life, as we all know. But he's a decent guy. And I so I, I kind of like that story. So I haven't, I haven't met him personally, but I've met him once removed, you could say. So if you, if you were called in by the transition team for your, your view, what would sort of be your three recommendations that to the, America, what, what it... What, needs to be done to improve I suppose to improve everything <laughs> yeah just just everything Tom um, yeah, well, you're right competence I think uh, people want to see with coronavirus competence and they want to see some leadership from the federal government they don't want the federal government to tell everybody what to do and obviously conditions in Alabama are different from you know Northern California or North Dakota but they do want a degree of competence. They do want a, a degree of respect for the science. And and Biden will demonstrate competence. He'll make mistakes. Uh, he'll also demonstrate respect for expertise and rebuild that sense of expertise. And also, if you want to make America great again, uh, leadership demands followership. And the current American president does not have outside the united states a lot of world leaders going that's great that's just the way we should go it's got so, he's got some but not the important ones not the macrons or the uh, you know the miracles or um or, or others so uh, uh competence uh, the degree of calmness and and fairness and he will he, i think he will be quite ruthless as well so he will be he will be decide his fate will be decided on how the American economy performs, how they deal with coronavirus, and if they can get, for example, a federal vaccination program to work so that everybody gets it. Uh, and then he can use that as a springboard, it seems to me, to revive the healthcare debate in a positive way. If you can make sure that governments... You see, let me back up a second. For For, for many years, the narrative in American politics has been governments are the problem. Uh, Ronald Reagan once said, you know, the nine or ten words that uh, sort of chill his soul is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Well, if the government can show through the Centers for Disease Control, through working with private enterprise to get a vaccine into people's arms, a vaccine that works, it will be a major, major boost to the idea that government can do things for you rather than just do bad things to you. And uh, I think that, to me, would be the core ideological thought uh, that I'm sure the Biden team will have in their mind. That's what they'll be judged on immediately anyway. And it will have great knock-on effects if they can do something to ameliorate by next summer the terrible problems that America has with coronavirus. So do uh, the American people and does the world have a cause for op- optimism? 
as a result of the recent president, the presidential elections in the US. What do you think? Uh, look at it the other way around. I, uh, if you had four more years of Donald Trump with a Senate uh, that was a Republican Senate and Trump unbound, no longer fettered by the fact that he was running for office ever again. My goodness, can you imagine? So <laughs> simply to go back to the start of our conversation, simply by saying that this was a referendum on Trump and thank goodness Trump lost, uh, I think we've got reasons to be optimistic. And I think we've got the other thing, because it seems to me so blindingly obvious, and that's one of the reasons why I think Brexit is such a terrible mistake, is that all the problems, all the big problems that we face are problems that are not national, they're international. And the idea that, that of it, total independence in an interdependent world seems to me rather odd. So coronavirus is just one example. Climate change is another. Migration, which is going to be the story of our lives going forward for years and years and years, is, is yet another. International crime, money laundering. I mean, we could go through them one after the other. But the really big things which affect our lives are international. And therefore, uh, there is no... America first solution to climate change. And there's no uh, Britain as a offshore island off the EU, but pretending that we can't really have a, we, we can get by without a trade deal with them. That's not a great solution for us either. So I think that to me is the challenge of the next decade. Will the 20s be a time when the populist solutions, the idea of ending globalization and uh, with all its problems uh, continue to rankle? Or will it be a time when we say, yeah, globalization's got a lot of problems and we have to deal with those. But actually, so many of the things that, which affect us are international problems and they require uh, international cooperation to solve. Well, let's hope that happens then, Gavin. That's what we want then. Well, there's hope. <laughs> That was a great insight, Gavin. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to talking to you again soon. I found it very interesting that some states like Florida voted for Trump, but they also voted to raise the minimum wage to $15 per hour. Polls show that most Americans want this, as well as universal health care and better Social Security. Now, will Biden deliver? Sadly, it seems unlikely, as the currently the Senate is a Republican majority and would block such moves. So while, while it seems that there will be little or no improvement in the fundamental problems of human unhappiness and financial hardship on a federal level, let's hope some states and cities will be more progressive. At least America is likely to rejoin the world on climate change and other multilateral initiatives instead of being inward-looking and conflict-seeking. As my friend Jennifer Nadel of the campaigning group Compassion in Politics noted on a recent episode of The Real Agenda, Joe Biden had said compassion was back on the agenda. So let's hope so. What do you think? Contact us at info at realagendaradio.org or via our website realagenda.org. We would love to hear your views and we hope that we can help inform, involve and inspire you into action. So what's coming up next on The Real Agenda? Well, we're going to be talking about rebellion, money rebellion, and how we can draw attention to the gross injustices in our economic system. We'll be talking tactics with Dr. Gail Bradbrook, co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, and about how history shows us that civil disobedience brings results. Now, one thing is certain, people want to see change to a more compassionate and just society, as well as more courageous politicians prepared to do the right thing for people over party. It's urgent and it's up to us to make it happen. Because that's the real agenda. I'm Tom Burgess. Thank you for listening and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Mm-hmm.